I have examined maps of the city with the greatest care, yet have never again found the Rue d'Ose. These maps have not been modern maps alone, for I know that names change. I have, on the contrary, delved deeply into all the antiquities of the place, and have personally explored every region of whatever name which could possibly answer to the street I knew as the Rue d'Ose. But despite all I have done, it remains an humiliating fact that I cannot find the house, the street, or even the locality where, during the last months of my impoverished life as a student of metaphysics at the university, I heard the music of Eric Zahn. HPPodcraft.com Ladies and gentlemen, it's H.P. Lovecraft's Dude, Where's My Car? What? <laughs> what? <laughs> well, it would have been pretty horrifying to live somewhere, to have lived somewhere and, and not, not be, able be able to find it. To find it. Yes. I mean, you really have a gap in your memory. Yeah, that's that's pretty tough. Or, you know, maybe it's not there anymore. Just gone. Just gone. I don't know, man. I don't, this is a, We've got some questions here about this story, and yeah. by we, I mean... Well, I'm Chad Pfeiffer. And I'm Chris Lackey. This is the H.P. Lovecraft Literary Podcast. HPPodcraft.com. We are discussing... The music of Eric Zahn. Yes. The story, the music of Eric Zahn. Yeah, the story of the music of Eric <laughs> Not Zahn. specifically the music of Eric no, Zahn. No, we never, haven't heard it. I we can't, we can't hear it because yeah, it's... It's fictional. It's fictional music. The story starts off with our narrator, um, again, being unnamed. Yeah, he's this uh, poor student of metaphysics. He's poor and he needs a place to stay. Money doesn't come easy to him, so he's no. kind of move, move around a lot because he, he skipped out on his rent. <laughs> yeah, he's a typical student of metaphysics, you know. Oh, yeah. If you're a landlord, you want to watch out for those guys. <laughs> but he finds this strange part of town where maybe he can stay. The Rue d'Ose lay across a dark river, bordered by precipitous brick, blear-windowed warehouses, and spanned by a ponderous bridge of dark stone. It was always shadowy along that river, as if the smoke of neighboring factories shut out the sun perpetually. The river was also odorous with evil stenches which I have never smelled elsewhere, and which may someday help me to find it, since I should recognize them at once. I have never seen another street as narrow and steep as the Rue d'Ose. It was almost a cliff, closed to all vehicles, consisting in several places of flights of steps and ending at the top in a lofty, ivied wall. The houses were tall, peaked-roofed, incredibly old, and crazily leaning backward, forward, and sidewise. Occasionally, an opposite pair, both leaning forward, almost met across the street like an arch. And certainly they kept most of the light from the ground below. You know, that reminded me, there's some streets uh, like that in York uh, when I went to visit uh, last last year. Oh, yeah? Where the buildings kind of are leaning like leaning forward that they almost arch over because they're they're so old. It's such a cool image. Yeah, it's it's really really cool. Uh, Now, he doesn't say specifically what city this is, but from what I've gathered, being it's a French name... It's probably a French city, if not Paris. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and also, Eric Zahn later tries to write something to our narrator, and uh, his French is bad, which tells you that our narrator is French. Mm-hmm. So definitely, I think we're in, uh, if okay. not Paris. Yeah. Uh, well, the mention of the river, I think, led people to think that that he he is talking about Paris. But, yeah. But you know, could be the Mississippi River. Maybe they're in New Orleans. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. Yeah. Regardless of where they are, I mean, this this area of it, the Rue d'Ose, has such a great feeling of place and it's such a great description and mood that's set right there at the beginning of the story. Mm-hmm. Actually, it reminded me of, if you're a comic book fan, Astro City is a oh, right, yeah. pretty cool series. They have in the um, the anthology Life in the Big City, there's a whole little story that takes place on Shadow Hill um, that really reminded me of this. Hmm. It's, um, check it out if you haven't read Could that. Could borrow, borrow a little from uh, yeah. Mr. Lovecraft. Certainly. And, you know, actually, speaking of New Orleans, when I was down there for that film festival, in our block of shorts, there was an adaptation of this uh, story. That there has about. been, I think, as far as I can count, five different adaptations of the story. And I'm and sure maybe there's more. more. Yeah. Maybe well, more. Funny thing is, we were watching, we our film and this film showed, this adaptation of Eric Zahn, mm-hmm. showed in, um, in a space called the Zeitgeist Cultural Center, which has, the walls are kind of... You know, crumbling brick, <laughs> and uh, so we watched it in there, and it was a cool place to watch the movie. But then also, when I read about the the, the theater, they had just done a theatrical uh, play version of this story like three years before in that same space. Wow! The urban decay and the weirdness of locality and the whole atmosphere of the story lends itself, I think, to adaptation. Right. Well, I mean, and the story takes place in basically two locations. It takes place right. in 
his apartment, and then, which you will soon see, Eric Zahn's apartment. Right. So our protagonist moves in on the street, and mm-hmm. um, he notices that the other inhabitants are, are very weird. It takes him some time, but he actually figures out what it is, is that they're all really old. It's old people. Yeah. One thing that makes it a little more, maybe less suspicious that he doesn't remember where this part is, is he doesn't quite remember how he got there. Yeah. He doesn't quite remember what it was that led him to no, this No, because the university, he knows, is only like a, like a 20-minute or half-hour walk, he says. <laughs> yeah. Like, he, he knows, I mean, you walk to school every day, you know, like, so right. he, he should know where he lived. Yeah. But he, he makes hints that maybe he wasn't in the best shape himself when he showed up at this place. Right. Uh, some, somehow he found it in the landlord, who's this guy named Blando. Mm-hmm. And the building he moves into is uh, it's the tallest building on, on this street. And he got a room on the fifth floor. On the night I arrived, I heard strange music from the peaked garret overhead. The next day, I asked old Blando about it. He told me it was an old German viol player, a strange dumb man who signed his name as Eric Zahn and who played evenings in a cheap theater orchestra, adding that Zahn's desire to play in the night after his return from the theater was the reason he had chosen this lofty and isolated garret room whose single gable window was the only point on the street from which one could look over the terminating wall at the declivity and panorama beyond. So there's this silent old German up there, and only his window can see from the top of that hill over that right, wall absolutely. into the city beyond. Now, I want to make a little note here. He says uh, that Eric Zahn is a viol player. That's right. And what Lovecraft actually meant by viol is a uh, violon cello violano cello mm-hmm. which is a cello right uh but the, when in, in italian a cello was called a, a violano violano cello right and this is confirmed in a letter that he wrote to elizabeth tolridge in 31 october on halloween actually in 1931 and he refused to he refers to zahn as a cellist yes. so in all the adaptations i've seen he's playing a violin right which is incorrect he should be playing the cello those guys are wrong yep so go go reshoot filmmakers. Yeah, sorry, all your work was for naught. <laughs> I don't think it really mattered. No, it doesn't. Really he matter. could be playing the musical saw, <laughs> which was a very popular instrument in the twenties. <laughs> it's a spooky sound, the musical saw. It is. It is kind of a little off topic. Anyhow, so uh, yeah, but uh, not. Okay, you're right. It's, it's on topic. We're talking about music here. Well, so our guy, uh, he likes listening to 1920s music, just like me. <laughs> so he's uh, uh, he's listening to Eric Zahn up there playing his instrument every night. And our protagonist, he's no expert, but the weirdness of this music is such that he thinks this guy must be some sort of genius. Yeah. This is unlike anything I've ever heard. These chords don't sound right. No. But I mean, still beautiful. It's yeah, still right. like, yeah, it's still amazing. Like, it sounds weird and kind of off balance, but it still works. So he wants to, you know, he wants, he wants to, to meet him. this guy. He and, meet um, and so he runs into the old man as he's returning from playing at his theater one night. He was a small, lean, bent person with shabby clothes, blue eyes, grotesque satyr-like face, and nearly bald head. And at my first words seemed both angered and frightened. My obvious friendliness, however, finally melted him and he grudgingly motioned me to follow him up the dark, creaking, and rickety attic stairs. Yeah, he's a little old man, basically. Yeah. And uh, with a satyr-like face, which I I thought was really cool. Uh, Well, so he goes up to Harazan's room, which is actually quite large, but, you know, it's so barren that that largeness just makes it almost more otherworldly. And the whole room terminates in that one window, Mm -hmm. which is curtained. There's so many cobwebs around, it almost looks like it's deserted. Yeah, very sparse uh, furniture. There's only, I believe, a bookshelf and like a a rack to hold music and stuff, and that's that's about it. it. So the guy locks the door once they get in there. A little creepy. He gives our guy a seat, and he plays for him for over an hour. And the music is really great. Yeah. It's, it's He's very into bizarre. it. He's into it. Yeah. Normally, I think that would be really uncomfortable, walking into a dude's place and having him play music for you for an hour. Yeah. But I reckon if the guy can't talk, if he can't speak... Yeah, what are you going to say? Yeah, maybe and his music is, is freaking awesome. Yeah, it's, so it's great stuff. He's, he's Although, it. you know, it doesn't really cover any of the really strange stuff that he's been hearing in the night. No. Those haunting notes I had remembered and had often hummed and whistled inaccurately to myself. So when the player at length laid down his bow... I asked him if he would render some of them. For a moment, I was inclined to use persuasion, and even tried to awaken my host's weirder mood by whistling a few of the strains to which I had listened the night before. But I did not pursue this course for more than a moment, for when the dumb musician recognized the whistled air, his face grew suddenly distorted with an expression wholly beyond analysis, and his long, cold, bony right hand reached out to stop my mouth and silence the crude imitation. As he did this, he further demonstrated his eccentricity by casting a startled glance toward the lone curtained window, as if fearful of some intruder. 
a glance doubly absurd since the garret stood high and inaccessible above all the adjacent roofs, this window being the only point on the steep street, as the concierge had told me, from which one could see over the wall of the summit. So, our, pr- our protagonist, he, he's, you know, to get him to play the music, he starts to kind of give it a whistle. The old man kind of flips. Yeah. Eric's like, do 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 and yeah. then he looks to the window, right. like he's afraid somebody's going to look in the window, which is on the top floor. Well, Just... of course, that makes the protagonist seem more curious, so yeah. he moves toward the window to pull the curtains aside and have a look out. Uh-huh. But Herzon does not like that, so he grabs him again <laughs> and begins dragging him toward the door. And our protagonist doesn't like that. No, so it's, a, it's not really a scuffle, but uh, yeah. he definitely kind of gets angry at, right. uh, at Eric, and uh, Eric kind of realizes, okay, I'm being a little, a little tense here, and he softens. and Yeah, and he says, uh, well, he doesn't say anything because yeah. he's dumb, but he, he's he motions, I'm going to write you a little note trying yeah. to explain this to you. And he's got bad French, but he manages to carve something out that our, our guy can understand. And it says, you know, look, I'm old, I'm crazy, can't stand people touching my things. And the weird stuff you were whistling, I, you know, I don't really like playing that. I don't really like hearing it, which is, you know, right. odd. I didn't know that you could hear me playing it at night. So please, uh, I'm going to get the landlord to get you a better room, but further away. Right. I'll take care of the difference in rent. You can keep coming up here to listen to me play my my, my standards, my regular, yeah. <laughs> my regular stuff, my uh, hits, if you right. will. Right, I'll play the greatest hits, but you're not going to get any of the deep cuts. No, uh, no B B sides here. And our protagonist is okay with that because he's a little crazy as well. And, uh, and as he says, my metaphysical studies had taught me kindness. <laughs> yeah, it's a funny phrase. Uh, yeah, I, the, this metaphysical studies. It's pretty. Uh, what does that mean? What does that mean to study? Metaphysics? I have no idea what it means. It's a branch of philosophy that investigates the principles of reality transcending those of any particular science. Oh, okay. It's one of the principles Aristotle came up with, first major work of branch of philosophy. Okay. So apparently it also teaches you how to be kind. I guess so. <laughs> we could use a little more metaphysics in all of our classrooms. <laughs> so the old man brings him up occasionally to hear music, but uh-huh. not really as much as he hinted like he would. Yeah. That was kind of a raw deal. But the guy did get a better place out of it. Yeah, really nice place. Yeah. It, when it's down on the fourth floor. Right, where yeah. you can't hear the stuff, which is no good. And when he goes up there, like he said, he's playing all of his weak stuff. He's not yeah. playing the, the good Coltrane, so- crazy jazz <laughs> stuff that freaks him out and he doesn't understand, you know. But he goes up and at night and he yeah. listens at the door. Yeah, he's- he starts sneaking up to the keyhole to listen. Uh, there, in the narrow hall, outside the bolted door with the covered keyhole, I often heard sounds which filled me with an indefinable dread. The dread of vague wonder and brooding mystery. It was not that the sounds were hideous, for they were not, but that they held vibrations suggesting nothing on this globe of Earth, and that at certain intervals they assumed a symphonic quality which I could hardly conceive as produced by one player. Then, one night, as I listened at the door, I heard the shrieking vial swell into a chaotic babble of sound, a pandemonium which would have led me to doubt my own shaking sanity had there not come from behind that barred portal a piteous proof that the horror was real. The awful, inarticulate cry which only a mute can utter, and which rises only in moments of the most terrible fear or anguish. Whoa, yeah. something, something's going on. Good thing he was lurking out there. Yeah. So he starts knocking on the door. No response. No answer. Knocking, knocking, thinking maybe the guy passed out or, or something like that. Yeah. Eventually, he hears Zahn stumble up, mm-hmm. close the window, and uh, and then stumble to the door. And uh, Eric Zahn lets him in. He sits him down and goes back to write him a note. He says, hey, you know, you got to be patient. I'm going to write in German all of the marvels and terrors that have beset me. Yeah. And, and then you'll know what I'm dealing with here. So he goes and he sits down and he starts writing furiously for an hour. Yep. Which wouldn't that... If, if, what if you saw the adaptation of the, that that play adaptation of that? <laughs> it's it was, done in real time, yeah, just yeah. for a full hour. It's for just, hour, an it's old just man a guy writing, <laughs> and another dude sitting there waiting <laughs> while he's writing. But it's so important for Eric to get this stuff out. Yeah, you know that he must communicate this stuff to him. And he's just for me to be able to get it. You know, I'm gonna have to write it in German. You're, you'll have to decipher it later. And, I, I guess. Yeah, he's he's writing and he's writing and he's writing. But then uh, he suddenly hears something. Eric Zahn does, and he looks up. Unmistakably, he was looking at the curtained window and listening shudderingly. Then I half fancied I heard a sound myself, though it was not a horrible sound, but rather an exquisitely low and infinitely distant musical note, suggesting a player in one of the neighboring houses, or in some abode beyond the lofty wall over which I had never been able to look. Upon Zahn, the effect was terrible, 
for dropping his pencil suddenly, he rose, seized his vial, and commenced to rend the night with the wildest playing I had ever heard from his bow, save when listening at the barred door. This noise, this, this note, this tone, just kind of snapped Eric to, to get up and just start rocking it. Yeah, it's like he's whistling against the darkness, you know? He's <laughs> playing something to drown out something else. Right, yeah. I imagine. Which is it's just pretty cool like yeah. i mean it's pretty neat and, and kind of creepy and this is the first time eric zahn's even pl- he's actually playing things by other composers just as quickly and crazily as he can which is something he'd never heard him do before right he's, he's really trying to drown out whatever this is in his frenzied strains i could almost see shadowy satyrs and bacchanals dancing and whirling insanely through seething abysses of clouds and smoke and lightning and then i thought i heard a shriller steadier note that was not from the vial calm, deliberate, purposeful mocking note from far away in the west. The shutter rattled more loudly, unfastened, and commenced slamming against the window. Then the glass broke shiveringly under the persistent impacts, and the chill wind rushed in, making the candles sputter and rustling the sheets of paper on the table where Zahn had begun to write out his horrible secret. I looked at Zahn and saw that he was past conscious observation. His blue eyes were bulging, glassy, and sightless, and the frantic playing had become a blind, mechanical, unrecognizable orgy that no pen could even suggest. A sudden gust, stronger than the others, caught up the manuscript and bore it toward the window. I followed the flying sheets in desperation, but they were gone before I reached the demolished panes. Man, what he thought was like a storm that was outside, the wind that was blowing, breaks the window, yeah. and the sheets that Eric was writing, what everything. he had saw, everything just gets blown out the yeah. window. All of that information that could have explained everything that's happening well, right now. All this now. weird stuff Lost. that's going on. So he goes, you know, our protagonist is going after those papers. Yeah. And when he goes after those papers, he, you know, kind of starts to go out the window, and he looks out I the window, and he sees. I saw no city spread below, and no friendly lights gleaming from remembered streets but only the blackness of space illimitable. Unimagined space alive with motion and music and having no semblance to anything on Earth. And as I stood there looking in terror, the wind blew out both the candles in that ancient peaked garret, leaving me in savage and impenetrable darkness with chaos and pandemonium before me and the demon madness of that night baying vial behind me. He staggers around in the dark. And- yeah, he flips out. He runs in and then he bumps into Eric. When he touches him, it seems he's dead, but alive. But he's moving. Like, he's cold to the touch, right? Is that? Yeah, absolutely. He's Well, he's struck by the bow when he's groping around for him, which means the bow is still moving. Yeah. He's still playing this yeah. instrument. And, 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 and so he wants to grab Zahn and save him from whatever this is. Yeah, whatever this, this stuff is happening. But when he touches him, his, his face is ice cold. When my hand touched his ear, I shuddered, though I knew not why knew not why till I felt of the still face, the ice-cold, stiffened, unbreathing face whose glassy eyes bulged uselessly into the void. And then, by some miracle, finding the door in the large wooden bolt, I plunged wildly away from that glassy-eyed thing in the dark and from the ghoulish howling of that accursed vial whose fury increased even as I plunged. There's something wrong, and he just gets out of there. This is a little ambiguous, exactly what, what's going on here, but he touches him, he's cold, his face is unmoving, and he's just playing almost like a automaton, yeah. you know? And that's enough. So the, our protagonist beats it. He, you know, not only leaves the room, he leaves the apartment building, grunts down the street, and yeah. he's out of there. He's off the Rue de he's out into the regular city that he knows. All he really remembers is that he was looking around and the lights of the city were twinkling. Mm-hmm. And, you know, obviously when he wants to go back... He can't find the place. Despite my most careful searches and investigations... I have never since been able to find the Rue d'Ose. But I'm not wholly sorry, either for this or for the loss in undreamable abysses of the closely written sheets which alone could have explained the music of Eric Zahn. The et is the end of the story. That is the end. So, yeah, there's some... I have some questions about uh, about the, the, the story that maybe you have some insight to. Mm-hmm. Now, at the beginning, he's looking for this place, can't find it. Right. You know, if you live someplace for months, and it's walking distance, I mean, he mentions that he can't, nobody remembers the landmarks that got him to the place, yeah. you know. So, is what happened to him so 
disturbing that it somehow erases this from his memory. Or, and this is kind of something that I was thinking of, maybe whatever Eric Zahn was holding back somehow came in and took that portion of the city away from existence. It's just gone. Oh, wow. Which to me is a little bit more horrific. Somehow this thing went through time and space, took part of the city away from from existence. Like nobody remembers it. It doesn't, you know, it never was. Except he remembers it because he touched this thing. Which to me is a much cooler concept. And I don't know if that's just something I'm reading into it. That's not. That hadn't occurred to me. I mean, I thought maybe the whole thing was a dream, Mm -hmm. you know, which would probably be the easiest explanation. Or he had somehow access to separate dimension. I mean, the, the character of the entire street is odd. Mm-hmm. It, it seems like it's out of time and all of the people are exceptionally old. Right. Um, I, it definitely seems like Eric Zahn is holding something back. Or maybe he's not holding it back. He just is privy to its, to, to hearing it. Maybe there's a, you know, like a, a Faustian deal that was struck at some point also. Uh, whatever this playing is, this otherworldly playing, is some kind of creature that gave Eric Zahn the talent to play what he does. And, right. Uh, you know, there's so much that could... It's left up to the imagination. Yeah, and I think that that's one of the strengths of the story, and that's what makes it so creepy, is that it's, you don't really get any explanations. Like, right. people, uh, Eric Zahn specifically, is doing stuff, and you never understand why, Yeah, which I think is cool, because a lot of times in life, things happen to you where you don't get the full story, and you never will. You get pieces of something, and you just kind of have to let it go, yeah. and, you know, just chalk it up to, I don't know what the heck happened. And yeah. why these people were doing things. What are their motivations? You, you know, you don't know. Not everybody comes with a, a biography or, you know, instruction manuals. And I think that's something that's kind of cool captured in the story. All these things happened. He really doesn't understand who this Eric Zahn guy is and mm-hmm. what he was about, why he was doing the things he was doing. And he's never going to know. No. I know. Which is kind of scary. It's almost as if Lovecraft took a second approach to a story he'd already written, in my mind. Take something like, uh, what's that M. Night Shyamalan sci-fi movie? Uh, uh, science? Science. Uh-huh. Interesting because it's about how a farmer and his kids deal with a massive alien invasion. Mm-hmm. But you only see things through their perspective. So the movie's not about the alien invasion. No. It's about how these people on the outskirts of that deal with it. Mm-hmm. And similarly, so many Lovecraft stories, they start with, I can hear the scratching on the window even as I write this. I wish I'd never done the thing that I said I was going to do. Right. Now that little manuscript that Eric Zahn writes, I feel like that's the actual Lovecraft story. But what he did was give us another guy who's not involved in that story. Right, right. His access point to it. What is it like for the student that lives downstairs from the Lovecraftian protagonist? That's awesome. You know what I mean? So I it, never thought of it. It's that like before. as he he never really gets to find out what's going on, and um, it's it's right. It's a similar kind right. of thing. So yeah, Lovecraft. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like Lovecraft wrote the story and threw it away. And said, you know what's more interesting about this? It's not what happened. It's the atmosphere. It's the otherworldliness. It's wow. the description of the place. So let's have somebody tell us what that feels like. Yeah. That's really cool. You know, to talk about a friend of the show, Ken Haidt, mm-hmm. uh, in his book, Tour to Lovecraft, he talks about uh, this story being his Lovecraft's first Lovecraftian story. Now, there's right. there's that quote from uh, also from Elizabeth Tolridge, who, you know, he wrote to about the cello you know about the zombie. lovecraft wrote to yeah. about the cello. same sure. same person and uh this is a quote from that letter which is kind of a famous lovecraft quote um even when i break away it is generally only through imitating something else there are my pope pieces and my density pieces but alas where are my lovecraft pieces mm-hmm. and uh ken says you know this is his first lovecraft piece outsider definitely poe other gods that we did last week mm-hmm. definitely done it and you can kind of go ping pong those yeah you're right all the stories and this really is it's his own thing mm-hmm. this isn't like any of the, uh, either of those two we're seeing lovecraft be lovecraft for yeah I, when you know you show up on the story thinking that you're about to get a poe piece yeah because of the parisian setting and, yeah uh-huh. and, but uh no that's not what happens at all you know it's f- uh, another funny thing that i read in uh joshi's uh, encyclopedia of lovecraft there was this french critic uh, uh jacques Begier. Mm-hmm. I can't pronounce French words, but mm-hmm. anyway, Jacques, he claimed to have corresponded with Lovecraft, and he wrote to Lovecraft and said, how did you, you know, write so well about Paris, and yet you've never been there? How did you manage to do this? Mm-hmm. And then uh, Jacques said that, <laughs> he said that Lovecraft's response was, in a dream with Poe. <laughs> <laughs> like, so, he was claiming that Lovecraft dreamt of this place and him and Poe walked around yeah. the dream version of Paris. Joshi, however, says that this 
there's no nothing to corroborate that Lovecraft ever wrote this guy. So right. this guy might have been a fan and then just kind of made up some stuff. But I thought that was a cool, that's hilarious, a cool story. I love the part in the story where Eric Zahn is playing to shut out the sound of the otherworldly playing from the window. Yeah, it's almost like. Um, uh, well, now people, that's, I, I said then whistling against the dark, but that's what you do. You know, you want to whistle a familiar tune because you're scared. Uh-huh. Um, but that happens in a lot of other stories. I think in, uh, I remember when I was, I read A Wrinkle in Time when I was in junior high. And, and I know that there's some part where uh, children are trying to shut out something that's going to possess their, their minds. So they go through nursery rhymes and fairy tales that they know over and mm-hmm. over in their head. Or in Stephen King's It, I think there's a little of that going on too. Where keep the monster out of your head. You got to recite things that you know. Uh, it's like musical sherbet in a way, you know. I, whenever you get something in your head, you didn't want it to happen, and now you can't stop singing it. You know, what are the things that you start singing to yourself to cleanse that out or to protect against it? You know, if it's you got the touch or uh, want to be starting <laughs> something. something. Yeah, you know. yeah. That's it. No, that's an interesting thought because I mean, for me, and I think that what I got out of it is that he was battling this sound. Like there was mm. something else that was out there playing, you know, like doing uh-huh. its thing, and he had to like kind of keep it back. And I mean, I think that's. What what was going on? But what happens what... if it was a country western song? That's definitely what would be going on. <laughs> but what, what actually happens to Eric Zahn? Like what? Why is he, just he keeps playing? playing? He just keeps playing over and over again. He's... It's it, it, it's really disturbing and 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 unquantifiable. And I think yeah. that's why it kind of makes this a really good scary story. Yeah. You know, Lovecraft thought that this was one of actually his better stories. He loved it. He himself liked it. He himself loved it. I mean, even years after the fact, he was a little understated, he thought, with it. You know, like maybe because, you know, he wasn't as... His language is not as flowery in this as it is mm-hmm. uh, in a lot of his other stuff. But a lot of critics also say that it's a little too ambiguous. Like, he should have right. been a little bit more descriptive and explained what happened and what was going on. But I disagree, because I think that's what makes this creepy, is you don't know what goes on, and you never do. And that's really neat. I agree. You know, it. you have stories where the... The turn or the um, the denouement is finding out what the source of all these things were. The horrific realization. Right. That's one of the things that Lovecraft is the most made fun of about. Yeah. Is the horrible realization that comes in the last paragraph. Mm-hmm. It's the italicized sentence. You saw it coming nine, ten, eleven, twelve paragraphs before. Right? Yeah. In this one, there's no turn. There's no. Yeah. Now the uh, the the disappearing place that happens in Pickman's model as well, though, doesn't it? He can't can even find the street where that artist studio was. Again. Oh right, yeah. yeah. So there are some motifs here he'll also yeah. play out again. I will play again. What do we have coming up next? Next week we have a reanimator. Or, I'm sorry, Herbert West reanimator. Ah, I don't want to confuse him with those other uh, reanimators no, that are running. No, no, this is Herbert West. Yeah, he does a very, his own brand of Yeah, reanimation. that's right. We've got that, and actually it's going to be a, it's going to be a two-parter. We're doing our first two-parter because yeah. it's kind of a big story to tackle, and we have a guest host. That's right. We have a special guest, the director of the film of the same name. Reanimator. Stuart Gordon. Stuart Gordon. So he's going to be our guest host next week. Um, and we actually recorded it out of order, so I can yeah. tell you it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good show. It's so, a really good show. Uh, tell so, your friends. Tell your family. Yeah. So tell everybody about it. Uh, I'm excited about it. You guys getting to hear it because Stuart has a lot of cool stuff to say. He does. Really insightful guy. So tune in for that. Always remember to visit the site and donate if you have the yes, uh, wherewithal. Again, we are offering the music of the HP Lovecraft Literary Podcast until the end of the year if you donate $20 or more. Uh, and that will be sent to you, all original music. Also, don't forget to sign up on our Facebook page and uh, on the forums. We all have a lot of activity. People are saying really cool, interesting things. Go find out what, what people are talking about. And uh, look out for some more Christmas poems from the lovely and talented Andrew Lehman. Uh, and with that, I am Chris Lackey. I'm Chad Pfeiffer. And this has been the HP Lovecraft Literary Podcast. HPPodcraft.com. HPPodcraft.com. HP